Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We are thrilled to present a panel today on the tech skills gap, what can employers and educators do? My name is Alexandra Levitt. I'm a business and workplace author, speaker, and consultant. I've been a spokesperson for DeVry University since 2010, and I am the chair of the Career Advisory Board. We are a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to helping all job seekers advance. So we are very, very excited to be here today. Uh, this is a discussion today on an issue that is very close to all of our hearts. In the next hour, we're going to be doing a lot. And I know it's, it's right at the end of the day, and we do appreciate you joining us very much. We're going to talk about this problem um, from the perspective of industry thought leaders, educators, and experts, and of course, the recent research that we've conducted on this topic. We'll look at some of the innovative strategies that educators and employers are using and the partnerships that they're developing to champion the acquisition of tech skills. And we'll suggest ways that we all are gonna work together to narrow this gap in the future. That's one of the reasons that we're all here today. So I am thrilled to welcome our esteemed panelists. First, we have Sarah Lay. Sarah is the Crotonville Digital Learning and Technology Leader for GE. She, she assumed this role in January 2014 and she has led GE's Brilliant U digital strategy, strengthening the company's performance culture through the development of a next generation learning community. Brilliant U offers transformational learning experiences from the Crotonville Leadership Institute and from world-class partners across academia and business to GE's global workforce. Sarah is a graduate of Florida State University with an MS in Instructional System Design and a an BS in Communication for Business. Welcome, Sarah. Next, we have Rob Paul. Welcome, Rob. Rob was appointed president of DeVry University in 2014, where he provides executive leadership to the university's national network of campuses and online programs. Rob is a member of the Proprietary Advisory Committee of the Illinois Board of Higher Education. He also serves on the Board of Trustees of DeVry University and previously served on the governing board of Carrington College and on the Board of Director of the Association of Private Sector Colleges and Universities. Rob holds a bachelor's degree in English from McDaniel College and a master's degree in organizational management from the University of Phoenix. Welcome, Rob. And last, but so far from least, we have Randy Zuckerberg. Randy's the founder and CEO of Zuckerberg Media, the host of Dot Complicated on Sirius XM, and the New York Times best-selling author of Dot Complicated. Randy is also the creator and executive producer of Sprouts Dot, which is based on her children's book of the same name. She previously led marketing initiatives at Facebook. Welcome, where? Welcome, Randy. So as I mentioned right before we got started, you are welcome to tweet the session at hashtag TechSkillsGap. We want everyone who doesn't have the privilege of being in the room today to hear the insights from our spectacular three panelists. And would also like to call your attention to Slido. Uh, this is our app today for asking questions throughout. So we will also take questions from the room at the end. But if you hear something that just inspires you instantaneously to ask a question, feel free to access the website, slido.com. Then you're going to put in the hashtag South by Southwest EDU. You'll need to also select this room, which is Salon A, and go ahead and type in your questions. And we will be looking at those and answering them at the end. Not complicated at all. You're like, then your social security <laughs> number, <laughs> then a few uh, other. Yeah. I actually was a little afraid myself, but it wasn't that hard <laughs> once I did it. And they told me right before we were about to start, so it's been okay. So let's start with the problem. One of the things we're going to do over the next five to seven minutes is just define the true problem of the technology skills gap. Now, obviously, all of you are here today because you know that there is an issue, but let's put some numbers behind what's going on today, um, at least in America. So what we know today is that 65% of organizations increased the number of positions requiring data analysis skills last year. That's according to the Society for Human Resource Management. 80% of employers currently have positions requiring these skills, and 78% are having trouble finding candidates. Now, as we'll talk about, data analysis is one of those skills that isn't necessarily something that resides in IT. It resides across many, many business functions, and therefore, the, these numbers are especially significant because we are looking for people across the organization. 
According to Code.org, there are more than 500,000 computing jobs open nationwide right now, yet fewer than 43,000 students graduated last year in computer science. So you can see that there is a huge deficit of this type of talent. We are simply not putting out enough students to fill these jobs. And when we look at the private and public sector, we tend to see these gaps and report on them more often. But the federal government alone needs an additional 10,000 IT and cybersecurity professionals in order to fill their open positions. This was a stat put out by the White House last year. I'm assuming that more or less it's still accurate. And again, this speaks to the fact that we are suffering deficits in many, many faces and many dimensions of technology. Well, before we go further, it's important for us to acknowledge that there are two different and very specific facets of technology that we're talking about here. The first is what we have termed with the Career Advisory Board as applied tech skills. And what we've defined that as is, is the ability to integrate people, process, data, and devices to effectively inform business strategy and plan for and react to unanticipated shifts in direction. So again, if you are working at any organization in the 21st century, you are required to have applied tech skills. And that's a gap that many of us five years ago did not anticipate. Then we have hard tech skills, and these are the tech skills that we traditionally associate with the information technology sector, and IT firms specifically. They're things like coding, data architecture development, and network security management. So again, there's the applied tech skills and the hard tech skills, and we're gonna be discussing gaps that are associated with both. So I mentioned that I'm chair of an organization called the Career Advisory Board, uh, which was established by DeVry University in order to help all job seekers advance. And every year, we do a research study called the Job Preparedness Indicator. And the goal of that study is to track the gaps between what employers are looking for in candidates and the skills that candidates are bringing to the table. And in our 2016 research, we uncovered the fact that there was a lot, there were a lot of people that were talking about the tech skills gap. But the question was, what exactly are the tech skills that are most needed and by whom, in what positions? And so that made us think, how can we investigate this more carefully? And so we decided to do a secondary study, which was called the Technology Skills Gap Research. I know it was a really intriguing title there, but it pretty much sums up what we looked at there. We asked 500 hiring managers, HR professionals, and also senior level executives and C-suite executives to reflect on the skills gap. What does it mean to them? And what are the imp what's the importance of both these applied tech skills and these hard tech skills? And here are some of the interesting things we found. First of all, this won't surprise any of you, this is the reason you all are at this conference, is that school preparation is not as wonderful as it could be. 62% um, of our respondents said students coming out of school are not prepared for jobs in their organization. And only 11% sc said school is very effective in meeting school needs. Now, once they're on the job, we'd like to think that things get better, that employees seek out the training they need to be successful, especially in those applied tech skill areas. But it's not necessarily the case. Hiring managers and HR professionals generally feel that employees are not keeping up. 44% said current employees are not keeping up with evolving skills required in their fields, and only 15% strongly agreed that employees actively seek out training. The training might be available, but they're not necessarily taking the time or making the time within their day to acquire new skills. And so the gap just keeps getting wider even once employees are on the job. So one thing that we continually ask throughout the survey is who needs applied tech skills and who needs hard tech skills? And our respondents came in loud and clear with answers to those questions. First of all, applied tech skills are increasingly essential for everyone despite the role that you might have, the organization that you might work for, it doesn't matter. Everyone needs to know how to apply technology to make critical business decisions. So 79% of our respondents said that for technology to be effective within an organization, it must integrate people, processes, data, and devices. And 75% said that employees of all types should understand how to use technology to inform and drive business decisions. 
Hard tech skills are still critical, of course, and they're more critical for IT, as you would imagine. 72% of IT professionals said strong software skills are important for job success. Um, that's much lower once you look across the organization. Less than half of those in other industries said you have to have good software skills. Organizations in general do not have enough of certain hard tech skills. This probably won't surprise you, network and information security topping the list at 80%, followed by some of the newer areas in technology where business is evolving so quickly to use these skills that we aren't acquiring them as fast as we need to. So we see things like cloud computing, web architecture, the internet of things at 72%, and artificial intelligence at 63%. In many cases, the technology is evolving faster than we can keep up. So without further ado, I'm now going to turn the floor over to our panelists, who I know you all have anxiously been waiting to hear from. And the first question we're going to ask is, what tech skills gaps are you seeing in today's workplace? And we're going to start with Sarah on that one. Hi. Good afternoon, evening, everybody. So if, we t if I give you the context of GE, right, if GE is a company today in 180 countries, all right, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, and really transforming to a digital industrial company, right? You may have seen commercials about this. What does that mean? GE becoming a very large software company um, in related to the industrial products that we sell. So if we look back 10 years ago, I, in coming into the IT organization, it was a very different conversation, right? IT was trying to be at the seat with business leaders understanding their processes, trying to help solve problems, and it was trying to get a seat at the table. Today, they are very much have a seat at the table, and now our business leaders are needing to change the conversation, and, and those applied test skills have become very much um, an important thing for them to be able to have conversations to talk about customer outcomes on how data and technology is gonna transform somebody's business, and so how do we enable that? So the skill set or the gaps that we've seen have really shifted in the past five years of, you know, our IT individuals or what you would term IT needing to have more the business acumen, but our business leaders who might have been running organizations or businesses for the past 20 years now have to come to the table with the tech skills. So it's, it's been a huge shift that we've seen. And, and keeping up and how do we do that. And so very much so as far as partnering um, and leveraging uh, various organizations because things are critically um, moving so fast that it's hard to keep up and, and bring the right um, content to the people when they need it. Excellent, thank you. Rob? Yeah, I, I would build on what Sarah's saying by saying as, uh, as educators, it's incumbent upon us to, to keep up we need to, uh, to be responsive and adaptive and ensure that, that uh, we're being creative with the way that we design our curriculum, the way that we deliver our curriculum in order to ensure that we're helping our employer partners uh, in closing that skills gap. Um, two things come to mind in, uh, in that regard. One is something um, I'll, I'll talk about called the tech path and the other is uh, this phenomenon that's, uh, that's emerging and actually has been around for, for uh, a few years here called boot camps. Um, the, the first, in regard to TechPath, this speaks to the applied technology skills that, that Alex mentioned uh, earlier. This, this digital mesh of people, process data, and devices. And as educators, we just need to come to grips with the fact that regardless of what a student's major is, they need to minor either officially or unofficially in tech. And uh, one of the ways that we've approached it, there's a lot of creativity happening out there, but I'll speak from, uh, from my institution's experience. We developed a program called the Tech Path, which is the integration of these concepts through a, uh, a rubric that we developed, people, process, data, and devices, uh, into the curriculum. So that whether you're an accounting major or an IT major, when you walk across that stage, you'll have a foundation of skills in technology that will be of value to your employer as you, as you apply your skills toward helping them uh, solve business problems uh, in the workplace. And, and then the other one just briefly would be the boot camp phenomenon. We've, we've all witnessed sort of phase one of the boot camps that have happened over the course of the past few years, which uh, was, was primarily focused on coding. 
There's a phase two happening uh, in boot camps, which allows folks to, uh, to tool up much more rapidly to address some of those skills gaps that you mentioned. And these are in the areas like, uh, like cyber security, uh, big data, analytics. You're seeing more and more boot camps in, in that arena. IoT, um, our division, which we uh, have creatively uh, named DeVry Boot Camp, uh, we, we, have, uh, <laughs> uh, we have partnered with Cisco to develop an Internet of Things uh, boot camp. Uh, and then next on the horizon will be advanced manufacturing, which we, we've developed a boot camp in partnership with uh, an organization called 180 Skills uh, out of uh, Indiana. And so, again, it's up to us as, uh, as educators to make sure that we are being nimble in, in the creation of curriculum and modalities without sacrificing academic quality, I'll underline that, um, in order to, to be responsive to the needs of employers. I hope you paid someone a lot of money to come up with that name. Yeah. <laughs> Research <laughs> branding, it's critical. <laughs> um, I think for me, I one of the things I also think about when it comes to the tech skills gap is a diverse uh, diversity and the gap that exists there. I know uh, personally for me, it's so exciting to to sit in a room like this with with so many awesome women and great guys because <laughs> I I feel like I'm used to talking to audiences of guys where you look out and you're like college student or billionaire, <laughs> and often it's both of those things. But um, but uh, so it's it's really exciting. But um, I think like a lot of us in this room. Sarah, I'm sure, like yourself, I spent 10 years pretty much being the only woman in the room in Silicon Valley. And so for me, the tech skills gap feels very personal. Um, it's something that I've really dedicated this next chapter of my career post Facebook to thinking about how we get more women, more diversity in, in the workplace, especially in tech jobs, because I felt like I had a very complicated relationship with Silicon Valley. On one hand, I loved being part of such innovative companies and on the front lines. On the other hand, I felt like, is it only one demographic that gets to decide what's innovative in this country? And um, and that was was complicated. So um, I, I think that's something that we really need to think about and, and focus on a lot more. I think we need to look earlier in the pipeline at education. Um, I think it's incredible. Uh, what's going, what's happening at, at GE, at DeVry, but I think we need to start with preschool, with early elementary. We need to um, start closing the, the tech skills gap early because a lot of the research has shown that if you don't especially get girls excited about tech from a young age, it's so much harder to get them excited. Um, and finally, I think um, what both of you are saying about the applied tech skills is really important because I'm seeing even in industries that you would never expect need tech skills. Um, people are, are looking for those skills. I um, I recently had the experience, I, I got to be in a Broadway show two years ago, which was an exciting experience. And during intermission, all of the actors would continually come up to me backstage and ask if I could teach them tech skills. And uh, they kept telling me that they were more castable, that they'd get more work if they actually had technology and social media skills that they could rely on in order to build their personal brand. So I think that that's something that we're seeing across the board everywhere. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great example, uh, as is the ability to and the willingness to learn, yeah. I would think, because we don't know what the technology skills are going to be that are required <laughs> in five years. Okay. So coming to the table, uh, our research has continually shown that when you're adaptable and you're flexible mm -hmm. and you're willing to say, all right, well, I have a basic understanding of technology knowing that I'm not going to be able to predict yeah. what's going to happen um, in probably even two to three years, let alone five years. Thanks, everybody. All right, we'll move <laughs> on to question two, uh, starting to dig in a little bit deeper here. What are employers and educators doing today to close the gap? So Rob, would you like to get us started on that one? Yeah, I'll start with that one. Kay. So <laughs> I, I think part of the reason we're here is there's a, uh, a compelling need for, for educators and employers to partner more closely in, uh, in a strategic way. And uh, referencing back to the uh, career advisory board data mm -hmm. from earlier, that 11% statistic jumped out to me. Mm -hmm. If you'll recall, it was 11% of employers, I think it was strongly agree that college graduates are, are coming out of school with the, the necessary skills and competencies to succeed in the workplace. So that was one perspective of employers. Some of you may recall a couple of years back, uh, Inside Higher Ed and the Lumina Foundation did uh, some, a similar set of research, only they polled educators. and. 
the results were 96% of college provosts and chief academic officers believed that they were properly preparing students for success in the workplace. So 11% <laughs> employers, 96% wow. uh, educators. Uh, a clear perception gap there that, uh, that is potentially a root cause for, uh, for the skills gap that we're facing. And so um, there's good news though that uh, a lot of, uh, of leaders in higher education are, are working proactively to help uh, do their part in closing that gap. There's great work uh, happening across higher ed. Uh, Arizona State University is doing some outstanding work partnering with, uh, with employers. There's Northeastern University up in Boston. They're doing uh, some fantastic work when it comes to co-ops and internships to help in, uh, in bridging the gap. Uh, there's Strayer University doing some good work. Within DeVry, uh, my institution, uh, we created a group, here you go, um, creatively named DeVry Works. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it and does. That team is responsible for forging strategic partnerships with employers to help them really in three areas, in meeting their talent development needs, their skills gap training needs, and their talent acquisition needs. And uh, we work with, uh, with partners like Walgreens and, uh, and Securitas and GE uh, to, uh, to work very closely with them. One way in which we do that is uh, through industry advisory councils. Uh, I was over in Silicon Valley uh, not so long ago at our, at our Fremont campus, and uh, we had an industry advisory council. So picture this, you walk into a room, there's round tables. Seated around those tables are hiring managers and leaders from Silicon Valley companies. And we had, uh, we had Google represented. Uh, we had, uh, who else did we have there? Uh, we had Siemens, we had Lawrence Livermore. We had 50, about 15 others from startups all the way to Google. <coughs> And uh, also seated at, the, at those tables were our faculty members and our deans from our engineering technology programs. And for about four hours, they sat around those tables, literally at the syllabus and, and learning objective level, combing through that curriculum in a, in a bit of a start, stop, continue uh, exercise. And our deans were able to come right out of those meetings almost immediately, within days, and, and almost live making those adjustments to the curriculum and, and dispersing it out through our, uh, our campus and faculty uh, network. And so a lot of institutions do have industry advisory boards, but in, in today's day and age, they must be uh, engaged and proactive. It, it can't be a once every two or three year process. It has to be uh, routine. And it can't just be, let's get together and have a steak dinner. They've got to sit next to each other and roll up their sleeves and, and really dig into the, uh, to the curriculum. So a couple thoughts. Okay, here. excellent. So Randy, you get the chance to work with a lot of uh, employers and educational institutions. What have you seen as, yes, as the big well, picture here? It's funny, I was kind of laughing about the, the stat that 97% feel they're preparing in 11, <laughs> uh, because it's, uh, it's interesting. If you look at 10 different computer science programs, like people graduate with 10 different skill sets from those programs. There's really no standard on, on what's being taught. And so um, you might find a, a program that, that really goes deep into the fundamentals of technology, mm -hmm. but then the company wants people who know about artificial intelligence. Or you might have right. a program that's teaching everything about cloud, and, and, and then you go to work for a bigger company that wants the uh, fun fundamentals. And so you're, you're kind of missing something wherever you are. And, uh, and that's why I think it's so important that employers start thinking a little bit more instead of, okay, we need to fill this exact specific skill set by changing the mentality a little bit more to a little more of a Silicon Valley mentality of, okay, let's hire the smartest, most curious, most creative people out there and then train them on the job to learn exactly what to do. I was thinking about um, one of the most, I think, rewarding career experiences I ever had, which was actually in my entry-level job at an advertising agency in New York City. And I got there, and I didn't know anything about advertising, but they had just hired, uh, hired people, I guess, based on kind of creativity. 
And uh, my first project I got staffed on, they took six of us and they said, okay, we're partnering you with the Special Olympics with nonprofit um, and you have six months to create an ad campaign for them. And so for six months, we got to just learn on the job and had all of this intense training. And I think that to me, I still call on that every day in my career. And I, um, I would not have gotten that job in the ad agency if they were looking for a specific skill set. So I think that's something that we need to, to work on more. We, ha we need to have employers weigh in a little more in the curriculum to say, okay, we need people with these specific skills. But employers also need to um, kind of maybe look for people that are, that are just smart and hungry and creative. And I think uh, also, I know I keep harping on it, but uh, I like you know, a lot of the work that I'm seeing and encouraging more women to get into the tech force, um, teaching uh, all of those tech skills with a focus on diversity across many different dimensions. Um, and uh, I, I just think, uh, a lot of what you're talking about with employers working together. I know, Sarah, you were mentioning an awesome program that GE is doing, so I don't, I'm not going to take the wind out mm -hmm. of your sails, but, um, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of great work being done to foster diversity in the workplace, but a lot more work that has to happen when you look at what yeah. the stats are. Yeah. No, I, I love the stat too, and I love the di I don't love the disconnect, but I find the disconnect intriguing between yeah. what employers are looking for and what schools are saying they're providing. And I think, mm -hmm. in all defense of educators, I, th I think educators have moved the needle. I think that if you look at what educators, by and large, were teaching about technology to the general population of students 10 years ago, it was practically nothing. Unless you were an IT-related major, you didn't learn any of these skills. And so I think that they are doing their best and in many cases, I, I think that what we've been alluding to here is that employers in some instances have unrealistic expectations. You ex they expect candidates coming to the table to be able to check every box. And our research has shown that over and over again when, in truth, what, what Randy is saying about if you're an employer, you know, don't look to check every box. Can they learn? Especially because, as we've been saying, these things are going to change. So just because they know about cloud computing today doesn't mean they'll know about cloud computing tomorrow. So with that said, uh, Sarah, would you like to tell us a little bit about what GE is up to with respect to closing the gap? Sure. So I'll hook on to what Randy was saying. And we do have a new initiative called Balance the Equation, which is really encouraging uh, women and girls in the technology. So we're committed to hiring 20,000 women into uh, engineering technology roles by 2020. Uh, we've done a lot of work through different nonprofits, our GE Girls program, which is at the elementary school, um, kind of like a camp during the summer, which we've partnered with like MIT, Georgia Tech, other universities and strategic locations um, to help bridge that gap, because we also <coughs> believe in, in bringing uh, great talent um, into the workforce, and we know that the statistics show that the diversity helps bridge that gap, um, and a lot of great things can happen. So excited about that. Um, we might have seen the new Millie co um, branding commercials. They're very inspiring with mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, really highlighting and promoting the celebrity of scientists. <coughs> Right, and really giving value and, and promoting um, great work that's been done. And you know, Millie has like a quasi, I don't want to call it a Barbie doll, but a Millie doll. Um, so some really great things and effort um, from our company wanting to support diversity in the workplace and some really strategic roles. And then I also think from a GE as an organization and a company, we have very much have a learning culture and we invest um, a billion dollars a year in learning and development and encourage that growth. And so I think to, to Randy's Great. point about s hiring the smart talent yeah. and knowing that everybody's not gonna come in with everything that they're gonna need. It's about the right fit you know, into the culture, um, into this global organization to, to do great things and make really um, amazing products uh, for the world, the power to cure so there's a lot of great cool stuff going on and we know it takes great talent and so there's a culture piece to that but there's also the skills piece and you know we talk mm -hmm. about you know that business leader who might have been there for 20 years and now teaching them the technology end right so everybody is is on that same boat it's not just our, our folks coming out of uh, college 
needing a, a specific skill set, and then in how do we partner and make that possible? Because things are shifting, right? Yeah. Five years ago, GE was not saying, hey, we're gonna be a digital industrial company, right? We were big in software, we were putting technology on products, but we've taken some major swings um, in the past few years to make thing, more things come um, to fruition and how do we do that? And that's for a lot of, a lot of skills and, and bringing the right um, development to people when they need it. Um, and I think as we've talked as well, how do you do that, right? We're GE, we're, we're massive, a lot of employees to try to reach. Um, so the technology helps enable that. And as we look as a company, uh, do we create it ourselves? Right, and, and roll it out, is that something kind of GE secret sauce that's important to us uh, mm -hmm. to make sure it's accessible and, and we wanna, usually that's around your, you know, your cultural things. But then, you know, do we, do we make it, do we buy it, do we partner? And so mm -hmm. that's where having strategic partnerships and conversations with, with great organizations make that possible. And, and bringing it to our employees in a way that's also consumable, because we also know not everything is a, maybe a boot camp. Maybe it's you know a five-week online experience. Maybe it's something that's just in time. So how are we bringing the right types of resources to our employees? And so mm -hmm. as, as Alex did my introduction with Brilliant You, we've been developing our own uh, learning uh, experience platform to make that possible. So as we talk about matching the skills that our employees need to the right development opportunities and how are we making those kind of algorithms possible, and then mapping that to the right um, resources, training, opportunities, and you know, that's not always something, and we've done in-house, right? It could be a DeVry experience or a TED Talk, right? Maybe you're needing something motivational, you're getting to go into a team meeting, but um, you know, how do we do that in, in from a tech perspective as well as technology changes and so fast and rapid? We can't create yeah. our own Python right. classes, right? That just totally. like the and Sarah, just a quick follow-up. So our research showed that employers are a little bit less than satisfied with um, employee motivation in terms of taking charge of their own skill acquisition and in pursuing training. Mm -hmm. How does Brilliant U help make that connection for them, that they want to acquire these skills, that it's good for their career? What things do you have in place to, to sort of boost that motivation? So great question. So part of it is knowing what you need, right? Mm -hmm. I think as you look at uh, your role or your job that you're doing, you're supporting, maybe you're not able to fully look around the corner of, of what skill set you should be anticipating. Mm -hmm. Kind of that's where Brilliant You helps make some of those connections for you by helping bring and recommending things or opportunities that might be the right fit for you at the right time. So that's one piece, but also many of us in, in a corporate world w take a lot of training or it's all tracked through our learning management system and that could be a whole nother conversation mm -hmm. for another time but mm -hmm. that's the, f it, the formal stuff right as we sit here are you finding nuggets are you learning something right so how do you capture the informal uh, and, and a lot of things that we do on the job are informal so within brilliant you we're able to to bring also not just the inform the formal but the informal from a kind of a tracking perspective so as an employee looks at what i have done for the year or the quarter or what have you it gives a much more realistic picture and as i'm having a conversation about my development my growth or where i'm wanting to go with my own career it helps that conversation you know, I think it's also uh, telling, you know, if I'm leaning more towards something than the other or I'm seeking out something maybe personally and I'm tracking it, what is that saying about my journey? And is that maybe talking about something for my next role? Maybe I'm starting to take more coding classes and, you know, I'm in learning and development and what does that say, you know, and then is that putting me on a different career tra trajectory, right? And then now what other, you know, trainings could I go after? So I think it's, it, Again, it comes down to utilizing the data and informing yourself and informing your organization um, and the organization helping and supporting you by bringing the right um, opportunities as well at the right time. 
Yeah, that's wonderful. It seems to meet the employee where he or she is. Exactly, right. exactly. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Alex, just a yeah. comment to add. I do think that uh, we've got a perfect storm evolving here. We're, we're on the brink of a renaissance or resurgence in investment, employees, employers investing in their employees. I mean, we, we're coming out of the, arguably the deepest recession uh, almost ever. And during that time, when, it, when companies are struggling, you all know the, the, the first thing that goes to the chopping block is the, usually the, the training and development uh, budget. And now that the economy is, is starting to, to make its way back, I do think, the, you know, GE never backed off on it, other organizations did, you'll see uh, increased investments, which represent opportunities for, uh, for additional strategic partnerships between, uh, between employers and, and educators. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to move into practical strategies, ideas that we can all implement tomorrow to speed up the process of closing the tech skills gap. Mm -hmm. So Randy, can you share some ideas of, for those of us in the audience who are a little bit lost on this tech skills gap and what to do? You know, how can we go about? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, kind of to, to weigh on what you were saying before, mm -hmm. where a lot of employers, they, they say, that, oh, our, our employees are not motivated to learn new tech skills. And mm -hmm. it, I think a lot of times that's because they don't create the culture inside those companies to reward people for seeking out tech skills. Um, it's all great to say, you know, go, go get more skills, but if you're then gonna turn around and ding people for not being 100% focused on their job, or um, then you're not creating a culture or environment that supports that. I know um, a lot of us in 2007, 2008 in Silicon Valley learned the hard way. Um, uh, I joined Facebook in 2005, shortly after the company started, and uh, the iPhone didn't exist at that point. So we were able to build a, a great business on, on the web, and all of a sudden in uh, 2007, the iPhone came out, and uh, nobody used the web anymore. <laughs> and so, and just like us, you had YouTube, LinkedIn, all of these companies started scrambling to retrain workforces of thousands of employees on how to develop for mobile first. And um, if we had invested earlier on in training people to take to look at some of those skills, um, we wouldn't have been in a position where every Silicon Valley company started scrambling at the exact same time and probably would have saved a, a lot of time and a lot of money in business. So it's not just like a, oh, it's so nice to have to, to train your employees. Like that was critical, a make or break point in the business of so many tech companies in Silicon Valley. Um, so a few things I think we can do, a lot of us probably put out job descriptions for open jobs in our companies. Um, make sure you're wording those job descriptions so that you're not alienating smart, creative people who could learn the skills that you need, but maybe just don't have them today. Mm -hmm. I think um, make sure you're creating a, an atmosphere of creativity where people can actually uh, pursue their passion projects within your companies. Maybe that's through hosting a hackathon. Maybe that's you know through a variety of things because what I found is that when you allow people to focus on passion projects, they will learn the skills that they need to make those passion Absolutely. projects happen. Um, and uh, I think also um, making sure that you're empowering your employees to be the best recruiters on your behalf because smart people know other smart people. And so instead of being out there saying like, okay, we need people with these specific skill sets, how do you empower your employee base to be out there? Um, on a, a slightly different note, I, uh, I'm very thrilled. I have a, a children's TV show called Dot that just launched a few months ago. It's about a very tech savvy little girl and her adventures in, in uh, science. She flies drones, she builds robots, she does all these things. So one other thing that I would encourage all of you to do is to use the power of entertainment and media in order to train your workforce and, and uh, close that tech skills gap because 
what I've seen is that sometimes when you can educate people without them even knowing they're being educated, that's actually the most effective way to bring people along and close those gaps. So, um, you know, definitely don't underestimate the pa power of being entertaining and, and funny. Yeah. And gamification can be yeah. a great model, especially for bringing people who do have the tech skills into the fold and helping to engage them more that's by right. giving them a fun project that can in turn teach other people that's right. the tech skills they need to be successful. Great. Sarah, any thoughts on what we can be doing to close this gap more quickly? Yeah, so speed is of the essence, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. for us, I think as we look at the way our company quickly shifted, knowing we needed to upskill business leaders as well as bring on a lot of uh, technical folks or upskill, we had to seriously look at how we were going to accomplish that, right? And, and one was knowing what they needed and, and helping to get that to them uh, quickly and then understanding kind of the like I keep talking about this, but the, do we make it, do we buy it, or do we partner? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's the partnerships because we have some um, specifics that are really important for us to accomplish and maybe we don't need that full syllabus. We need three-fourths of it with a little of this sprinkled in. <laughs> and so those partnerships really make that possible, um, as well as I think the modality, right? Mm -hmm. So many organizations that we partner with are bringing things to us, uh, whether it be in, in small bites of content, right, bits of content, or in through the credentials or a course um, in online modality. So that's been important for us too. So being innovative and doing that because, mm -hmm. you know, even at the most technical skills that are being delivered in virtual settings is amazing, right? And I am very thankful that technology has, is where it's at today to be able to do that, because as I look at a workforce of over 300,000 people, we, we have a lot of people to, to reach. Um, and so that is the flexibility of, of using various platforms, as well as the partnerships help us really enable the speed that we need um, in, the, in the company and some of the initiatives that we have. And, and I love Randy's point. Uh, we actually have five learning priorities for our, for our company this year. And one is curious for context. So bringing that curiosity, mm -hmm. right? We're a over 125 year old company and we have been on a, a, a mentality to work like a startup or entrepreneurs within the organization, um, giving us flexibility to be creative and innovative um, with our products and, um, you know, so that's a lot of things to help us with speed too, as we wanna work and, and have the best outcomes for our customers. Uh, GE does a great job with what we call the employer value proposition. That you really tell candidates up front, like, this is what we're all about. We're about innovation. And then it attracts the people that you want to have apply. Yeah. You guys also do a great job with the kind of like enter disguising education as entertainment with like some of your fun podcasts mm -hmm. about alien life and some <laughs> of the stuff that you're doing is, uh, I think, is, yeah. is a really great example of uh, how, to, how to come at it from an entertaining perspective, too. Yeah, no, that's a great example. Rob, thoughts on right, what we can be doing? From, uh, from an educator's perspective, I think what, what we can do to help in closing the skills gap practically mm -hmm. is work to expand the base of potential future employees so it's not as, as narrow of a, of a focus as it has been and monolithic as it has been historically. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, engaging with, uh, with women, with minorities, with another group, which is the, the non-traditional student, the, the working adult student that maybe with the proper retooling and retraining could, uh, could engage in, uh, in the workplace very successfully. Not could, can definitely engage in the, in the workplace more effectively. A couple uh, examples that uh, at, at DeVry, um, we're celebrating this year the 20th anniversary of an initiative that we call Her World. And uh, what we've done over the years is we've invited thousands upon thousands of high school girls to visit our network of campuses nationwide. And they participate in Her World events. And it's a whole day of activities, including uh, team building activities. The last Her World event, they, they gathered together and they, they actually built computers. So they, they, the teams got to leave with uh, their own uh, computers that they designed together. And then we bring in or WebEx in uh, uh, executives from, uh, from uh, tech companies, uh, Microsoft, Google, Cisco, uh, that also happen to be women. 
And uh, so they have uh, uh, mentorship opportunities and, and role modeling opportunities, all about giving them exposure so they can gain a competence that is quickly followed by a confidence that, uh, that they, can, they can tackle this, this type of a, a, of a career field. Um, and then just on a fun note, the other thing that we've implemented in our campuses last year is something called a tech playground. And so this is a, uh, a space dedicated in our campuses where students, regardless of major, can come in and they can tinker and they can create, they can explore their, their curiosity. Uh, they, can, uh, they can play with the latest technology that sometimes isn't even in the curriculum uh, yet. Uh, they, can, they can look at uh, vir virtual reality, 3D printing, um, ar artificial intelligence, all in a hands-on environment that is very fun. So there's mm -hmm. a uh, edutainment component yeah. uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to <laughs> that as well. Again, just breaking down those fears, building the comfort level and confidence, and, mm -hmm. and encouraging um, maybe non-traditional groups to follow uh, a tech path mm -hmm. uh, as, as far as a career. What, what I love about the Her World is that I think uh, one, maybe if I can add one more thing I would encourage is to uh, encourage mentorship, especially if um, you are looking at areas that um, gender diversity, racial diversity, uh, as you're looking across the board, um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time in my own tech career, like searching and looking for a mentor. And I think um, if we can help set up those mentorship opportunities, we'd see a lot more uh, bridging of that tech skills gap uh, across more diverse playing fields. So I think um, that's something that employers can certainly do. And uh, if there aren't enough employees in your company to match up mentorship, uh, there's peer mentor networks that are available also. Yeah, that, that's a great suggestion. So uh, before we go to the audience questions, and there are quite a lot of them, so I promise not to hold us up too much, but I know some people are probably wondering out there, we're, we've been talking a lot about the importance of educational and employer partnerships. And I'd love to know, can one of you comment on the anatomy of what a partnership might look like? like how do you get started? Who puts the ball in motion to get something like that going? Maybe I'll start. And so it, it's sort of an all of the above. We, mm -hmm. we engage, DeVry Works engages with, uh, with employers through a variety of ways, but really in those three categories, yeah. talent development, which are degree programs, uh, skills gap training, so things like you know, when, when Jeffrey Immelt declared that everyone will develop a skill in mm -hmm. coding, then, then skills gap training uh, would, would, would come into bear there. Um, and then talent acquisition. Um, in a simplicity, that's, that's sort of bringing the cream of the crop to uh, graduating classes to bear for specific employers so they can sort of cherry pick uh, talent from, uh, from the graduating classes. We're working right now with uh, SpaceX um, with uh, engineering technologists. Um, we already have a handful working there and uh, they are actively now recruiting from our graduating classes nationwide. And so there's just a couple of examples of how we, uh, how we initiate. Excellent. Yeah, so when I was mentioning partnerships earlier, uh, I'll give you an example. We had a need within our leadership organization, a lot of requests coming in for executive presence. Right? We had a lot of leaders um, presenting to their organizations, to their customers, et cetera, and we had quite, a, quite an outline. And as with one of the partners that I work with, he said, I think I know of a, a group, an organization that has this, this course and pretty much what you're looking for. And we went and asked and so they took their curriculum, moved it online, and now it's a, an offering that we have within GE. And so it's part, part of identifying what's your need and then having a great network of partners to be able to say, maybe do you have this, right? I've, I've looked for it, I haven't found it. And it's amazing how the network can, can deliver, right, and, and quickly. So that's been a great success story. Um, many organizations uh, working with great professors will say, you know, we, we could bring a course to you. We just need to know what you need. Um, yeah. And so I, it's, it's really the, those partnerships. And so I, I have quite a few within um, Brilliant U that I work with within the network. And, you know, I never, you know, many could say, oh, those are our vendors who are bringing you content or courses or et cetera. 
and, and really it's not. It's, it's really a partnership because oftentimes those partners are working with me and helping with um, creating a podcast within the Brilliance podcast that we have or contributing to our daily blog um, called Smart Bits, right? So this partnership is, is really working together on um, helping our GE employees grow and be better, but also bringing great thought leadership from some great organizations Dravai and others. So for us, it's, it's just being very transparent about yeah. what our needs are um, and, and opening those doors. Yeah, I think those are great examples. And I think it's all about, too, just keeping an open dialogue, starting with one partner and communicating with them over time and just keeping those lines transparent and open so that you can learn what each other needs. All right, everyone. So without further ado, we are going to the audience Q&A. And all I have to say about this is way to use Slido. We have about 25 questions here. <laughs> so I'm going to go from the bottom up. Right. First come, first served. Yep. If we do not answer your question for some reason, feel free to, to come up to us afterward. We'll be hanging around a little bit. Um, questions for about, about the research that we don't get to, feel free to visit our website, careeradvisoryboard.org, to get the full executive summary and press release and materials around that. So if we don't get to those questions, they'll hopefully be answered that way. So the first question here says, school is pretty general. Did the survey look at liberal arts versus technical schools? Applied at or hard skills at both? The disaggregated data would be interesting. And the answer to that is we did not break down uh, those two different types of educational institutions in the survey. I do thank you for that question, though, because as you can see, our research always builds on each other. So once we do one study and we find some exciting data that really makes us think, we're looking for the next step. And so this question may, in fact, be a really good next step for our next piece of research. So thank you. And yes, several of you asked about the presentation being available afterward. We will get that to you for sure. OK, here's the next one from Ronaldo. Besides the obvious things like coding, what else should we be teaching to small kids in terms of tech? Randy, all right. do you have some ideas yes. there? Okay. Well, first of all, it's just funny. I was sitting here when you were talking about the tech playground, thinking like yeah. if only someone could help me with the tech skills gap in my own family. Like <laughs> my two-year-old walked up to a metal water bottle the other day and went, Alexa, play Mickey Mouse, <laughs> like to a water bottle. And uh, and I just, I just started to think to myself, I was like, oh my God, I better keep learning about tech and staying on top of this my whole life. And even if I do, I'm still going to get lapped by this kid, like no matter <laughs> what I do in my life. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I love about the, the world we live in today is there's so many ways to get children excited about tech that don't involve gluing them to a screen. I think uh, as parents, we tend to kind of um, go to a place of guilt and anxiety for mm -hmm. some reason when we think about children and technology. And uh, we, we think, like, I, I can't tell you how many parents I talk to, they're like, oh, I'm a bad parent. I'm giving my kid an iPad. Or we immediately go to a place of guilt. And, um, but there's, there are hundreds of ways to introduce children to the basic comp, uh, you know, coding, engineering, logic um, that never once involve a screen. If that's mm -hmm. if that's what makes you feel guilty, and uh, first of all, it shouldn't make you feel guilty because um, a, a lot of the research that we were talking about, especially if you have daughters, is showing that it's critical to introduce girls to tech and screens at a young age. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, I love uh, a lot of the the gadgets, and I'm seeing everything from the Fisher Price Coda Pillar to um, Kubeto to um, Dot and Dash, the little robots that you can program. I mean, those are three of hundreds of toys that exist out there that uh, kind of build that early love of, of tech and engineering. Um, I also think you know we need to look at a lot of uh, the policies that are going on in our schools. I mean. There are more than half of the states in this country don't recognize computer science in as math or science credits that go towards graduation credits. And so if uh, a lot of schools get their um, funding, they teach to funding based on curriculum, and if computer science doesn't count, then guess what? They're not gonna teach it. So um, I think this, is, this needs to come from the schools, and it needs to come, unfortunately, if it's not gonna come from the schools, it's on all of us as parents to make up that gap and that deficit. 
Randy, I don't know how you knew, but you answered two questions in there. So oh, awesome. thank you. All Someone right. else was asking about the toys that you would recommend to <laughs> young kids, and you did a great job with that. Okay. Yeah, just to yep. that. I mean, also in the, especially, you know, spring is coming up, hopefully. I mm -hmm. live in Chicago, so hopefully that's the case. <laughs> um, but in the summer months, you can look around now in your local communities, and there are many boot camps that are offered by colleges yeah. and universities and providers geared toward kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the you know to help keep them occupied during those uh, summer months. <laughs> I know Northwestern in Chicago has uh, has one. Mm -hmm. As do most of the Sylvan Learning Centers uh, across the country. Now are offering coding uh, boot camps in the in the summer. So another place mm -hmm. to to look. Thanks, Rob. Great. Well, a bunch of you just upvoted the following question. So I guess you really want us to answer it. <laughs> Who should pay? to close the tech skills gap? Is it students? Is it government? Is it employers? Schools? And we have to answer it because no. <laughs> there were eight upvotes for that one. <laughs> I think it's like yes and to mm -hmm. all of those things because right. I don't think the onus falls on any one. Right. Um, I do think when people pay for their education, they take it more seriously. Agree. Um, and so I think that that's, that's definitely one component, mm -hmm. but uh, definitely the onus needs to fall also on employers and, and schools as well to close that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think you're on the right track. I think it's, uh, it's across the board. Um, you know, as we said, we're, we're seeing a uh, resurgence and in investment uh, in tech skills gap type training from employers. Um, you know, the government for the, for the right programs that are steering students toward uh, these types of skills gaps, you know, there's probably some work to be done there in terms of, you know, blanket funding for every major under the sun mm -hmm. versus, you know, let's mm -hmm. invest the taxpayer dollar into programs that will yield uh, a career on the other side. Um, you know, there's some, some debate around that. And then, um, yeah, I agree. The individual mm -hmm. makes the investment and there's, uh, there's much more buy-in there. Mm -hmm. I think there's a question behind the question on that one that yeah. uh, yeah. we can maybe go into offline. <laughs> <laughs> you can come up to us afterwards. Yeah. So if anyone <laughs> in the room would like to stand up and proclaim their question loud and proud, you're, you're more than welcome you know, to. Some real uh, we're just uh, going through these, these questions here, but sure. There we go, go ahead. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. You don't. I can yeah. hear. We can yeah, hear you. I love it. <laughs> In the course of your discussion several times, yeah. you mentioned specific examples of collaboration mm -hmm. or efforts, mm -hmm. and while I applaud all of them, mm -hmm. they're not national and they're not likely to see scale. So the question is mm -hmm. who are the coalescing forces mm -hmm. for larger scale efforts? For example, for Robert, mm -hmm. there are So what are the, what potential is there for a larger scale effort around a common taxonomy, a common platform, something mm -hmm. that's larger and mm -hmm. national in scope to try to solve this problem for the economy as a whole? Mm -hmm. that, that's a fantastic question. You know, I think what's, what's happening sort of by default are events like this are, are emerging, bringing together educators mm -hmm. Um, there's another event, uh, ASU GSV, some of you may attend that. That's where a lot of the sort of the more progressive thinking is, uh, is happening. And then, you know, we're taking that information back to our institutions and promulgating it throughout the various groups. But you're absolutely right, it's, it's, it's uh, very disjointed. Um, but there are institutions, we're, we're one of the few, so that, that do have a, a national presence, so when we have when we're able to partner with a GE who also has a national footprint, you know, we're able to, to address that coast to coast and really around the world uh, online. And many other institutions are, are able to do that now through, through online learning so that they can, um, you know, they can offer these benefits on a, on a larger scale. But um, you know, is there a, uh, you know, a, a single group that, uh, that colleges and universities are, are coalescing around? Not yet, but I like the vision. That you set yeah. forth. So. Yeah. 
It's a good place to talk about innovation. Well, we are just about out of time, so I would like to thank everyone for joining today. I would like to thank you for all the wonderful questions. We will get those answered for you if you'd like to talk to us afterward. Thank you so much to our wonderf wonderful panelists, Randy, Rob, <laughs> Sarah. Thank you. Great <laughs> audience. Great audience. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Enjoy happy hour and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.